Good day, and welcome to Optimizing Your Web Checkout Process. Chuck, are you with us this afternoon? I am with you, yes. Uh, we are starting a little bit late. We thank you who came early for sitting around. Again, uh, the, the web component works good. It's just like the old-fashioned analog telephone was sometimes having a bit of a a bit of an issue. Well, I would like to go ahead and uh, get the show on the road by introducing our special guest, John Horn. John is the principal, the founder, and <clears throat> lead uh, consultant with JMH Consulting, which is a firm out of Atlanta. Their specialty is working with continuing education programs uh, in both the management and operation of programs and certainly in the marketing. Um, I've had an opportunity to, to know John professionally for a number of years. I've talked to people who have uh, engaged him in the process, and uh, we're actually, and, and in the full disclosure, actually have a project going on with uh, John's group to help us with some marketing at the ASWARE side. So, John, I think if you don't mind with that, I'll let you ta let Lori turn it over to you, and if you'd like to add any other elements uh, to, uh, to your uh, to your uh, session uh, by way of bio, please do so. So, John Horn. Great. Thank you, Chuck. And that was such a gracious introduction. I don't know that I could add much uh, to that. Um, but uh, let me uh, let me just start by, by thanking uh, you guys, Chuck and Lori, for all your work in, in putting this together and the others uh, that have been uh, involved in this. Uh, it's been, this is the first time that I, I'll have delivered this particular presentation and it's, it's something that I've been thinking about for a number of years and, and certainly our firm has done a, a number of projects around web checkout. Uh, Lori, I lost music. John. Audio. Oh, can you not hear me? Uh, I can hear both Chuck and John, so I'm, I'm good okay. on this side. Well, I'm going to continue and assume, assuming that the audio here is, here is working well. Um, but this is the first time I've, I've delivered uh, this particular presentation, and I'm very excited about it. I think there's some, there's a real opportunity in this area for uh, many, many schools in, in the continuing education industry. Um, as Chuck said, I, I won't spend much time talking about ourselves, but just enough to give you a, a little bit of, of context. So yes, our firm's been around since about 1997, 98, um, and we work uh, pretty much exclusively with college and university programs that are catering to non-traditional students. So that's the world that we live in. Um, and the way we like to describe ourselves is we're a consulting firm with marketing expertise. And, and what we say that, the differentiator that we say that brings is that we're always looking at your business model, um, not just delivering great marketing. So, so understanding that marketing fits into the context of all of the other things that, that an organization is doing um, helps to make sure that not only are we doing good marketing uh, and helping schools to, to market correctly and well, but also making sure that they're making the right decisions about how they allocate budgets toward marketing, uh, product development, and various other things. Um, as well. A another thing that you will find about us, uh, and many of you may have, may have seen uh, webinars that I've done through um, UPSIA or presentations at ACHE or KUSE, um, but we are ruthlessly data driven. Almost everything that we do involves metrics, measurements, because that's really the way that you know things are working. Um, and I think that's an area in which this industry for a number of years has been has been hungry for, and in the past few years, I've actually seen a lot of progress uh, in, in our industry around making better data-driven decisions. Um, and the third thing that we uh, that we like people to know is that we are actually in the trenches. As Chuck mentioned, there's two sides to our to our work. One is on the marketing side, um, and then that's what this presentation will will focus on aspects of that. But we also we partner with schools to actually build launch market and manage uh, professional education programs. So we are there in the trenches dealing with many of the same uh, challenges and opportunities that, that you guys may have uh, in your own programs. And I think that gives us a, a good perspective when we are working in the marketing side. So uh, with that said, um, let me tell you a little bit about what we're here to talk about today. So of course, this is about checkout process optimization, which is a, a subcomponent of, of an area referred to as conversion optimization. So we'll first talk a little bit about what is that, um, and, 
and what, what role does it play in the overall marketing and sales uh, process um, in higher education. Then I'll talk a little bit about my own personal experience with checkout process op optimization and, and give you a real life uh, case study um, that impacted our, our programs um, at, at a university. Um, and then kind of expand on that and talk about the potential business impact that, that what we're talking about today could have for your organization, um, which, which I believe is substantial. And then the bulk of this, uh, of this webinar today will be 10 best practices. So I'm going to share with you 10 techniques, tips, approaches um, that you can take back with you and starting today can begin to implement in your own checkout process to hopefully improve that process, improve your conversion rates, and again, the bottom line being get more enrollees, get more new students, get more recurring students, and, and hopefully more revenue. So that's the, that's the flow of what we'll do. Now, as we get started, and start with, with, a, with talk about, well, what is conversion optimization, obviously, is trying to get more conversions. Um, and in this case, we're talking particularly about your website, your online presence. Um, and so I guess we should start by defining what we mean by a conversion, because there really are two major categories of conversions that we think about in our work. Uh, one of those is what we call a lead conversion. And when we're dealing with something like a degree program, maybe it's a master's uh, program, or uh, maybe it's a, a credit post-baccalaureate certificate, or, or a non-credit certificate, in many cases what you're going to be getting off your website isn't necessarily an enrollment, but it's a lead. Either it's someone starting an application process, someone joining a mailing list, someone um, uh, signing up for an information session. Those would all be examples of, of leads, and those can be very viable goals for online marketing, because once you have that contact with that individual, your admissions team or your sales staff or your customer service staff can follow up with them. Well, this presentation is going to focus primarily, although not exclusively, it's going to focus more on the second type of conversion, which is an online enrollment, which is to actually get someone to go through a checkout process, probably put in a credit card, although not always. We've seen, we've seen examples from our clients where, where they don't take payment at the time of registration, but, but to get someone to go through that registration process and complete it. Um, and so conversion optimization includes both of those realms this presentation is going to focus more so on the second. Now, this is a good time, uh, Lori, for, for us to launch our first uh, poll of the day, if you have that ready. I do. Hold on just a second. Well, I didn't know. <laughs> OK. And you want to know what percentage of registrations come through the website, correct? That's it. Just a, a general sense from you guys about um, about approximately what uh, what percentage of your registrations uh, or enrollments uh, do you get through your website? And folks and must understand how this is done because they're already voting. I just love an, an, an organized political organization that just speaks their mind. <laughs> <laughs> And so again, and I would, let me jump in, John, for the ACEWARE customers who are coming, of which we've got a fair number. Uh, remember that on your, your dashboard, uh, the F9 key, you've got the percentage of registrations right on your dashboard. So if you've not checked that, just press F9 and it'll give you the percentage. So, Lori, Excellent. how are we doing on, a, on our voting? About 85% of our attendees have voted. We'll give them about three more seconds to vote and get everybody's vote in and counted because it's still rising. Good, good, good. And we're going to go ahead and close the poll in three, two, one. And we'll share the results. Wow. Excellent. And good on you folks who have more than 75%. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, not not entirely surprising to me. It's it's interesting to see the the diversity and the spread uh, in, in the answers. Um, what I found is in in the in our work, those of you who don't know, we spent about eight years um, helping build at Emory University a professional education program consisting mostly of of non-credit both uh, 
individual courses and certificates. And what we saw is every year we saw about a 2% increase in the number of enrollments coming through our website. It started in somewhere around the mid-60s and went up to the, uh, to the low 70s um, by, by last year. So, so that's, that's about what I expected to see, although it's nice to see my, my assumptions uh, confirmed. And that just speaks to um, the, the importance of our website and our online marketing uh, funnel in, in making sure that our business stays strong and that we continue to get enrollments for, for our programs. What you can see here, this is, this is if you've been to other webinars or, or presentations I've done, I, I use a similar uh, diagram to this quite often to explain uh, my take on the marketing funnel. And in this case, this is sort of an online marketing funnel um, in that we have this awareness phase right, and, and uh, of marketing. And, and this follows also the traditional ADA model of, uh, of marketing, awareness, interest, desire, and action. Although I, I use some different phrases here when I'm talking about online uh, marketing. But we see most of our, what we think of as, as typical marketing is actually in this first phase. So search engine optimization, paid search, uh, like Google AdWords, uh, marketing on Facebook or LinkedIn, uh, email, and then all of those different types of, of very viable traditional marketing uh, from radio to print to brochures and, and catalogs. You know, the, the, the purpose of all of that is to either to get someone to call um, you or to get someone probably to come to your website. Um, and so I use this slide very often to talk about the importance of not forgetting about or overlooking these final three stages. Because just getting someone to your website, we've seen examples uh, of clients where you know, they get very, very few registrations coming off their website, but are getting lots of traffic there. And then you have to ask the question, well, where is that breaking down? And it's almost certainly breaking down in one of these, these final three stages. Either people are getting there and you're not keeping their interest long enough to move them into this engagement stage. Um, and we, we capture interest by having clear navigation, a well laid out page, maybe some multimedia elements on the page, just something that's going to give people a reason not to hit the back button or to, or to bounce somewhere else. And then once we keep them there for a little while, we've got to start to engage with them. We've got to get them to sort of to start to imagine themselves enrolling in this program and what would this be like and how would this improve my life or be an enjoyable experience for me. Um, and at some point we have to use in this engagement stage things like calls to action or things that they can interact with on your website so, um, to, to start to engage them. And the calls to action could be things like register today, or it could be uh, join our mailing list, or sign up for this information session, or contact a student advisor. Um, and then at some point, if we're going to have an online conversion, we move people into this final stage. And this is where our focus is going to be today around how can we make this last stage as strong as possible so that if we do all of the good work in the awareness stage and get people to our site, we've kept them interested, we're engaging them, they click that register now button, uh, and they move into your registration checkout process. How do we make sure that we create a process that is as streamlined, as simple, as unconfusing as possible um, so that we have the maximum number of people that are completing that enrollment process. So this is kind of what that flow might look like, right? People are going to come into your website somehow uh, and they arrive at a landing page. This doesn't have to be a, 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 a custom design landing page. Your site's home page is a landing page. Every page on your site is a potential landing page. So once people arrive, they may explore a little bit and get some additional details about the program that they're, that they're interested in. And then at some point, they may express some intent. And this is them moving from that engagement stage to the conversion stage. Now they've said, add this course to my cart, or I'd like to begin to enroll. And then typically what we're going to see is then a multi-step process, a multi-step checkout process that they're going to move through. At some point, they're going to enter their personal information, name, address, phone number. At some point, they're going to enter their payment information, most likely credit card, uh, expiration date, etc. There's maybe a, a final stage for them to confirm all that information, and then they reach the goal, uh, and they get a confirmation that they have, they have indeed um, 
registered or enrolled in, in the program. And so our focus here is about making these step one, step two, step three as simple and, and clear as possible um, so that we maximize registrations. So at this point, um, Lori, if, if we can put up that second uh, poll. If you want to know about marketing budgets, I would assume. Yes, that is it. There you go. You Great. So in this case, uh, completely anonymous, um, but just your guys' sense of, of, you know, and if you have to estimate this, that, that's fine as well. This is just to give us a general sense of kind of the scope and scale uh, of the marketing budget that you might be working with. And again, all of your data is going to be anonymized um, through this process, so you're not giving away any trade secrets. Folks must be thinking about this one a little bit longer because they're taking a little longer to vote. Yeah, this is a little tougher. And John, by this I assume not only you know out of cash, but if you've got personnel like uh, an employee who is dedicated yeah. to the marketing function, give some reference to the amount of budgets for that salary line or percentage of the salary. Absolutely, that I, I would I would definitely include that. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. That I do consider time to be part of your part of your budget. So. Yeah, some uh, fraction if coordinators are doing their own marketing, if some guesstimate of what percentage of time the program directors actually spend in the marketing effort there. That's right. That's right. We're going to close the poll in three, two, one. Share the results. Okay. So a lot of people struggling with low budgets, yep. Yep. Uh, yep. 65 yep. percent less than $50,000. Absolutely, and that's not that's not surprising, especially for for smaller programs. I mean, you know, the, the you know cost has to certainly go to paying instructors and and uh, overhead and, and and all of those things. But this gives gives us a good sense of kind of where um, what you're facing and what you're what you're working with um, in, in terms of marketing. And I would say, regardless of where your your budgets fall in there, even if you have a very small marketing budget, the nice thing about what we're talking about here with conversion optimization is that a lot of this stuff you can do yourself. Um, many of these techniques can be done at little or no cost. Now, obviously there's more sophisticated approaches with some A-B testing, things like that that we'll, that we'll get into here, um, but, but you can do a lot of this stuff without, without necessarily, although we always like to be hired, without necessarily hiring an outsourced uh, expert firm like, like ourselves. So, um, with that, Lori, why don't we just throw out this third poll, and, and I think I'm already going to know the, uh, the answer we'll get from this, but let's just get a sense from people about um, how much money that maybe they're spending out of, their, out of your marketing budgets, um, what portion of that uh, in, in fixed dollars um, have you allocated toward improving your checkout process? All righty. I'm guessing this will be fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like this is going to be a fast poll. <laughs> and, and people telling me, and we probably should have thought of this, uh, we should have put a, we're not doing anything towards Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, increase. that'd be in the less than category. Let's so. put that in the uh, less than 10,000. Yeah. Uh, we'll give it just another couple of seconds. And, and John, of course, if you want a yes/no question, John, Lori can put up a raise your hand poll if you want to just ask if anybody here has spent some money on optimization conversion, you know, and that we could just see if there are a few who are doing that. So that's sure. that's a that's a tool we can do. We'll see what the results are. You ready, Lori? Let's see. Yeah, go ahead and raise your hand if you have spent some money. But let's anything um, on this anything. conversion optimization. So it, it's, the poll is done. So you can finish the poll. Okay. Explain the hand if you haven't got that to people yet, Lori. I have not, but if you would raise your hand just once, and the icon will indicate whether or not your hand is raised or lowered. So go ahead and raise your hand if you have spent some money to improve your web checkout process. If you've done anything, whether whether money or I assume you've had a staff working on that to, to really work on it. So, yep. All right. 
Uh, People are raising their hands, so we'll hang on just, get a few. just give us a yeah, second. Count to five. Guys, you know it or you don't. Five, four, three, two, one. About, About a quarter of our participants oh, okay. reports that they had spent some money at least. So that gives us some indication Good. of what this 90% means. Okay. Right. Um, that off the screen for you. And, and that's... Uh, and that's encouraging to me. I, I can see the results uh, from the poll. The vast majority of people have, have spent very little, if anything, um, on it. But it's encouraging that people are thinking about this. And that's my sense, uh, is that, that conversion optimization, I would say, five years ago was, was not on most organizations' radar in this industry. Although certainly when you look outside of this industry to e-commerce sites and some of the big box retailers with their websites, it's been very high uh, on their radar for five to ten years now. Um, but I've, in the last few years, I've started to see some conversations around this at conferences, especially marketing-related um, ventures. Uh, and and you know what what I'm going to argue, uh, and, and I'll share with you some of my experiences with this, um, is that is that you should be thinking about um, allocating a portion of your budget. And again, this can be a time that you're spending. Uh, so you may have your your direct dollars allocated to awareness marketing, but in that case, I would say spend some time of yours or your marketing staffs on this conversion optimization. And then it should be part of your marketing mix. Otherwise, your marketing is is I would say is potentially too heavily weighted toward awareness marketing and simply getting people to the site, and you may actually gain a lot more out of balancing that marketing a little bit to make sure that once they arrive at your website, especially if you're getting in the 50, 75, or even over 75% of your registrations to your website, making sure that the website itself is doing its job. Um, and, and I put an asterisk here to make sure that, that you understand when I talk about conversion optimization in, in terms of budget allocation, I do mean more than just your checkout process. I do mean things like testing different landing pages, testing different um, inquiry forms, uh, different calls to action, on, on your website, adding some additional calls to action, giving people more options of ways that they can engage with your organization. Um, all of those kinds of things uh, really ought to be part of a, of a holistic marketing strategy at this point. So what I've given here is just a, a hypothetical uh, allocation. Uh, and I also included, again, measurement and, and reporting, because we are um, very data-driven in our work and find that that's how you know that the rest of your marketing dollars are being spent well because you're testing, you're baselining, you're measuring, you're comparing um, pre-baseline measurements to post-initiative um, measurements and seeing if you've actually moved the dial. And then you might still have the majority of your budget going toward awareness marketing, but also making sure you're spending some time or some, some budget dollars on improving your website, that interest and engagement area, making sure that your navigation is clear, that you've got simple calls to action, that you're engaging people, and not to forget about the conversion optimization. So what that would look like if you were taking a $100,000 um, marketing budget, which I realize is going to be larger than, than some people in attendance and smaller than others, but if we use this just as a hypothetical, um, this is the way it might break down. So, so just to make sure that we are that we are spending our time and energy in the most efficient ways. We want to make sure that, that the conversion stage is part of our thinking as we're marketing. Now, um, with that, let me share just briefly with you a little bit of my own experience with this and how I became uh, essentially uh, a disciple, baptized uh, um, as a religious metaphor into this world. Um, it was actually a very scary uh, time for us. So. Uh, some of you may, may know our firm, know that we spent about eight years in partnership with Emory University um, building a professional education program. And toward the end, it was about a three to four million dollar a year um, revenue stream for the university, um, which was great. Well, in 2008, um, Emory uh, purchased and implemented a new uh, non-credit registration system. And I'll clarify, this was not ACEWARE because I don't want to cast aspersions on, on, on Chuck and his team. This was, uh, and it wasn't entirely our decision about this, this particular registration system, um, but it was selected and it, and it included an online checkout process that replaced the previous process the university had. Uh, what we found, and we were measuring this the whole time because I was concerned and to see how, how it was going to affect our, our enrollment rates from the website, 
what we saw within a couple of weeks of this implementation was conversion rates dropped on the website by around 50%. In other words, we were getting half as many registrations as we had been before this new system went into place. And the screenshot at the bottom is one of the just original screenshots. You can see we put a, we put a branded header on, on there, we put a sidebar on there, so it didn't look, you know, it still looked like a, a university um, site, but you can see sort of the middle of that page, the big gray and blue stuff, uh, was just not that attractive. Some of that information was a little bit maybe confusing. And so what we did is we immediately started to look at our marketing funnel. And if you use uh, Google Analytics or another sophisticated uh, web analytics tool, you may have access to, to information like this, which actually shows how many people make it through each stage of the checkout process. So in this case, we had a, uh, a six-step process finalizing the sixth one being the actual enrollment uh, and we were able to look at our data and see how many people were moving from one step to the next and what this allowed us to do is to, is to try to figure out where was the problem happening were people not entering the shopping cart or was it that once they entered and added a course and started their checkout process was that the point at which they they jumped out of the uh, of, of the process and what we found was the vast majority of the people we were losing we were losing in steps one and two as you can see only 63 percent of the original thousand people here in this data set moved to the second step and only 64 percent of that subset moved on to the third step and so what we knew is that we needed to put some some attention to those first two pages um, or we were in we were in serious trouble from a from a business performance perspective and so what we did is just a purely aesthetic uh, pass. And this is the, the, the screenshot on your left is the original one. The screenshot on the, on the right was our, was our first redesign. Uh, we did several more uh, iterations beyond that um, to further improve it. But what we found was that where our conversion rate with this original design was at 1.5%, we were able to get that up to 2.2 percent, uh, almost a 50 percent increase over the the pre uh, makeover uh, conversion. And this Emory University site overall, this department had around 50,000 visits a month uh, coming into this website. So that 0.7 percent doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually amounted to about. 350 additional registrations every month that we were going to lose if we hadn't done this, or you could say that we regained through doing this. Um, and based on the based on the average course price that we're talking about, that actually amounted to about $900,000 in revenue. So this is the point at which, uh, and, and in making these corrections, this is the point where I started to really um, envelop myself in what is conversion optimization. I bought several books bought some research reports on it, spent weeks really studying this, and, um, and, and I'm a firm believer uh, because of, of both this experience and some others that we've done with clients that, that this, is, this is powerful and this can make a real impact on your business. So with that said, it's a good segue in talking about the business impact. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about how, how this, how conversion optimization or checkout process optimization works in combination even with other marketing efforts. So here's a, here's a quick chart. Um, and what this shows, if you just look at the two data points that are, that are highlighted here, that have the arrows pointing to them, what this shows is between one month and the next, July and August, um, in this particular site, um, we had two things happen. Um, the site, we began to do some, uh, some online marketing, and we increased the visits to the site by 35%. At the same time, we did some conversion rate improvements on the site and had a 1.4%, as you can see, going from 3.4 to 4.8, we had a 1.4% improvement conversion rate. The power of, of spreading your marketing budget and allocating some to the conversion rate is that when you're doing both other forms of marketing and conversion optimization, you get a multiplicative effect um, on your on your enrollments and your and your bottom line, your conversions in this case. So a 35% increase in visitors and a 1.4% increase in conversion rate 
actually resulted in 85% more conversions because we were getting more of those increased visitors to convert as well. So that's where I really believe that this can, this can have a powerful impact. Um, as you see here, if, you know, just as a, as a quick sort of uh, back of the napkin math um, calculation, if you get about 10,000 website visitors a month and your average enrollment fee, and I know some may be lower than this, some may be higher than this, but if your average enrollment fee was about $300 per enrollment, if your website has a 1% conversion rate, um, and we've seen several schools with conversion rates even below 1%, um, out of the 10,000 people, 1% is going to mean you're going to get 100 registrations through your site, uh, and you're going to make about $20,000. If you've got a 2% conversion rate, you're going to get double that. So just by changing that conversion rate, even if your website visitors or total visits don't change, you can move your bottom line. You can increase your, your, your gross revenue. Um, and what I always like to point out to people, because sometimes people will say, well, yeah, but that's doubling your conversion rate, right? Going from 1% to 2%. That's, that, is that really plausible? And I always like to say, well, turn it on its head and think about it this way. You're actually not doubling your conversion rate. You're simply reducing your non-conversion rate from 99% to 98%. Out of 100 people coming to your website, if you can just convince one additional person to enroll, um, that doesn't seem as daunting. And, and that's really what we're talking about here. And just convincing one more out of those 99 people, convincing one of them to stay and enroll can actually double your revenue if your conversion rate is 1%. So that's, that's the goal of this. So again, coming back to our um, coming back to our overall uh, marketing funnel, we're putting all this effort into awareness, getting people to our website. We want to make sure that once they're there, we're doing everything that we can to make it as simple as possible for them to get through that checkout process. Um, so just before we go into our 10 best practices, I've got a couple more uh, interactive little things for you here. We're not actually going to take a poll in this case, um, but I'll just let you guys think about this. I'm going to reference some, some A-B testing. And what that refers to, A-B testing means uh, that an organization has taken two different, in this case, designs or page layouts, and they have tested them uh, simultaneously with audiences. In other words, the first visitor would get version A, the second visitor would get version B, the third visitor would get version A, the fourth visitor would get version B, and so on, collected several thousand um, results from that sort of alternating display of these pages, and then from there measured certain metrics, whatever they were trying to, to improve, to see, if they, to see if one of the two of these designs uh, worked better. And Google has a tool called Google Website Optimizer that makes doing this fairly straightforward. We've done it with, with several clients, and it can be very, very powerful. So let me just give you a, couple, uh, a few quick examples of this to get you thinking about uh, conversion optimization. And since most of this presentation is going to focus on the checkout process, I thought in this case I'd actually start with a couple of examples that are lead generation um, conversions. So what you see here is, a, um, is an A-B test from this website called whichtest1.com. It's a fantastic site. I recommend you uh, take a look at it um, on your time and, and spend some time there. You can learn a lot. But on which test one, this was a test that Redstone College did comparing this, these two versions of this landing page um, to see which was going to be better at generating leads. Now, if you look at this, and you're maybe probably studying this, um, these two designs, there's only one difference between them. The only difference in these two designs is they are mirror images of, of one another. One has the form on the left, one has the form on the right. But what they found when they tested these, you guys want to guess? You can make your own kind of guess in your head. May, may I guess? <laughs> the, one, 
the one on the right generated 25% more submissions than the one on the left. And I was running this by my, uh, my wife last night, and she was very, uh, she was dead set that it was going to be the one on the left. And actually, what, what they talk about on which test won for this particular test is that they believe this is actually um, related to being right-brained or left-brained. If you'll notice the particular um, topic here, it's a very technical topic. My wife is a, is a high, if you're familiar with DISC, she's a high I, a, a very people-oriented person. And so their belief here was that because this was tailored at very technical, mechanical audience, the one on the right appealed to that audience more. But their, their bottom line was, you got to test this stuff because a 25% difference just from flipping stuff on the page, goodness. Give you one more. So this is Walden University, again from which test one, and what they did is they took uh, the only difference between these two pages is the one on the left has a button, uh, a blue area that says talk to an advisor with a request information button that leads to a page with a form on it. The test on the right has the form built in, uh, or at least the first few fields of the form built into this, to the page itself. Um, so think about which one you think will perform better. Is it embedding the form or linking to the form uh, with a nice, very visible button? And what they found, almost 75% more completions when they embedded the form uh, in the website. Right? So these are the kinds of things that we talk about when we talk about conversion optimization is are there techniques we can use, sometimes simple changes like this, that could nearly double, I mean a 75% increase in, in, in form completions could nearly double the number of leads that you're getting from, from your website. Not, certainly not every test has those kind of results, but this one I particularly liked because of the simplicity of it. Um, here's one more, and this is not from our industry, it's the Laura Ashley site. Um, the, the primary difference on this site, there's a couple of differences. One, they spelled out the, um, the delivery charges a little bit more on the one on the right. They actually put some dollar amounts in there. But the bigger change was a shift in the buttons. You'll notice the one on the left has um, only two buttons at the bottom uh, that, are, that are close together on the right side. The one on the right has three buttons spread across the bottom. So think about which one you think might perform better here. And it was actually the one on the left. About 19% more people clicked on that go to checkout button to advance to the at least the first step of the checkout after they'd added this to their cart um, with the button orientation on the left. And what this was attributed to, at least by the, by the people conducting the study, was fewer options, right? They, they took that update shopping bag button and the one on the left has it as a small text link um, up on the next line that simply getting rid of, of an extra option there um, convinced more people to just simply proceed to the next step. And I'll have some screenshots from, uh, from other websites later on in this sort of showing that same, that same idea. So this is the kind of thing we're talking about when talking about conversion optimization. Um, now I'm going to spend most of the rest of this time talking specifically about checkout process, although I will say many of these best practices apply to lead generation forms, and they also in many cases will apply to an application process. So if you have degree programs or maybe a, a, a certificate program that has an application um, form or set of pages built into it, many of these same principles apply. So with that, number one, I thought I would start with, with the most obvious, the most high level. We'll get, a, we'll get significantly more detail than this. But the biggest thing that we see, and the, probably where you may have the most room for improvement, is just simplifying your form. Um, only ask for information you absolutely need. Now, obviously, this has to be balanced against you know, gathering marketing data or other things. But we know for a fact from multiple, multiple research studies that the fewer things you ask for on a form, the higher percentage of people will complete that form. So that's a fact. So again, balance your need to collect things like survey questions or demographic questions 
against the fact that you may be losing enrollments because you're asking for those. Um, and as we'll see, uh, things like survey and demographic questions, one of the techniques that I like is let people finish their enrollment process. Once they get to the confirmation page, at that point, give them a link that they can update their profile and their interest areas and give them a reason to do that. You know, say, you know, if you give us this information, we can communicate with you more effectively, blah, blah, blah. But, but hold that until the end, if, if possible. Or even do, especially demographic questions, gosh, you can embed those in your post-class uh, evaluations if, if you really want that information. Um, and then anything that's an optional form element, if, if it's optional on your form, think really hard about whether you need that. Um, you know, we see, like, contact us forms, for example, that are uh, asking for things like mailing address, zip code, you know, and if this is simply just to, to let somebody contact your school, unless you're going to be mailing them out an information packet, you don't need their mailing address. Uh, maybe you want to ask for their zip code just so you have an understanding geographically of where your leads are coming from, but you don't need all this information. You could simplify a form like this to be a form more like this, and it's almost guaranteed that your conversion rate will go up. Here's another example. This is actually um, from, uh, from our uh, site at, at Emory, um, and notice it asks for two different addresses at the top, then it asks for how did you hear about us, and then it asks for interests and preferences. And we did some customization. We couldn't remove things from this uh, just because of the system we were using, but what we did is we moved the continue button that was only at the bottom. We placed a second one up midway down to try to affirm to people that, look, if you don't want to go through this whole interest thing, you don't have to do that. We put the word optional in big red to, to, to say to people, you know, don't worry about it if you don't want to fill that out. You can just continue on um, after filling out the top portion of this. But this, to me, is an overly complex form that's, that's fairly daunting for people. Um, and this is, by the way, after our simplification efforts. Um, here's another example of just um, demographic information on a on a sign up form. And again, uh, you know, if, if there's a if there's a genuine reason for collecting some of this information, that's that's fine. Um, but by eliminating some or all of these kinds of questions, you will increase your conversion rate. Number two is related to that. Um, my second recommendation is, you know, in addition to simplifying the form itself and eliminating unnecessary information that you're asking for, um, simplifying the template, the, the header, the footer, the sidebars, all the stuff that surrounds your, um, your, your page, simplifying that, especially links that appear there, which offer people the opportunities to sort of change their mind and back out, um, streamlining that will increase your conversion rate typically. This is Amazon's. This is a, one of the stages of Amazon's checkout process. Um, and this is the entire page. This is it. That's all there is. So you'll notice there are essentially, you know, there are four or five things you can do here. Um, and two of them are continue. Um, so Amazon is really streamlining and kind of gearing people toward, and you know, notice what's the biggest thing that stands out on the page. You know, there's their logo and there's the word continue on the two buttons. Um, so that's what they're encouraging people to do. Um, here's an example from, uh, from Southern Methodist uh, University. And this is, uh, sorry, it's a little bit uh, grainy, but what you see here, this is a page when you're first looking at a course, right? And so this, if we had this sidebar on our page as we went through the whole process, it's tempting people, it's tempting them to maybe click on one of those links and jump back and look at the courses again or look at instructors. There's all these sort of just tantalizing links over there. So what, um, what's happened is um, Lindsay at SMU has been working on this, and here's what happens once you start the enrollment process it cuts down to this. And, and thanks to, to um, you guys at Aceware for all your work on this as well. I just, I love this, um, the cleanliness of this, of this checkout process, because I know, Chuck, you guys have been working closely with, uh, with Southern Methodist on this. I think this is a beautiful example of a simplified um, checkout process page where the proceed to checkout button is nice and visible, right? 
and it's perfectly fine. Uh, one of my uh, one of my staff members years ago told me that he's always been a fan of of R and D, um, rip off and duplicate, <laughs> right? So it's perfectly fine that you know, hey, Amazon has a big red yellow a big yellow button that sort of stands out on the page. Well, you know what, Amazon has poured millions of dollars into usability research, so if it works for them, there's a good chance that, that mirroring some of those techniques is going to be good for the rest of us as well. So a so good example of a simplified, uh, um, simplified form in terms of, of layout. Third item, if you have pages in your, uh, in your checkout process, your registration process, or an application process, that have long forms on them. Um, do things to try to make those long forms look less daunting. Um, do, you know, and one of the techniques is grouping elements on those forms. Here's another test from, here's another uh, uh, sample from which test one. So uh, screenshot on the right, screenshot on the le left. You'll notice that in this case, the big difference here is the way that they group things. The one on the right uses these big blue bars to sort of create smaller chunks of, of data entry sections for people. And what they found when they implemented this is, or tested this, they got 23% more form completions for the one on the right that had, um, that had a different uh, approach to grouping items on the form. So these are good things to test, um, and, and to reiterate, this may not work for you, and that's why we always recommend A-B testing in situations, uh, because the, the screenshot on the left is also grouped, uh, and, and grouped fairly nicely, but in this case, the blue bars, I think, just gave people a nice mental sort of break between these sections and made the form seem less daunting. My fourth recommendation is, in whatever way you can, make sure that you're on multi-stage checkout processes or multi-stage registration processes, make sure that you're giving people a sense that they are making progress. You can see in this screenshot from SMU, the enrollment progress meter in the bottom left of the page, and as I go from one screen and, and then go later in the process, it's showing me that I'm nearing completion. Um, this is important. There's been some, there's been several research studies that I've seen that have talked about how when people, especially if it has several steps in the process, people might be 70, 80 percent through your checkout process and something comes up. They get a phone call or something. At that point, they need to know, am I right at the end of this or is it going to take me another five or ten minutes to complete this, this process? And if they know that they are near the end, they are much more likely to go ahead and finish that, that checkout process. So we always want to give people a sense of where, where they're at. And you can do that in a number of different ways. You can use a checkout meter like we just saw. You can show people what stage they're on. Um, it doesn't matter so much how you do it or what it looks like um, in, your, in your system. Uh, it just matters that, that people have a way of knowing where they're at in the process. So these are all different examples from, from various, uh, various registration and, and checkout processes. Um, number five, I touched on this a, a little bit earlier, but make sure that the next step that you want people to take is obvious. Make that button stand out uh, on the page. Don't make people hunt for the continue button or the, or the continue checkout button or whatever you're going to call it. Um, here's an example. This is going to be kind of a pre and post example um, from some of the work that, um, that, that SMU has been doing. You can see in the, in the example on the left, there's lots of buttons, right, which may be confusing people, um, and the finish registration button is, is one of them. And then here's the, here's the redesign work where the proceed to checkout is, is very visible, it's obvious, and they've also um, uh, narrowed the, the, the options to just these three that are probably the most likely people um, might be doing. So an excellent, uh, an excellent evolution there. Um, number six, uh, and I apologize for the, the, the quantity of words on this page. I'm usually a very visual presenter, but I just had a lot to say here. Uh, communicate with people. Um, add 
additional information onto your checkout pages. If you think, number one, if you're asking for anything that's unusual, that people aren't used to seeing in a checkout process, like um, birth date or um, gender or anything like that, um, is there a reason you're asking for that? And if there is, tell people what that is, and that helps them. Like, if you need to ask birth dates because you have some programs that are catering to kids, but you need to make sure that this person is above the age of X, tell them that. Put that on the form so that people know why you're asking. If you're asking for unfamiliar data, um, give people little tips. You know, you'll see on, on credit card pages, for example, anytime it asks for a security code or a CVV, it's sometimes called, you'll see a little link that says, what's this? And that's a great technique if you're asking for anything that you think people might be confused about. It's just give them a link that explains a little bit about what that is. Um, or if you need data entered in a certain way, like if you need a social security number entered with hyphens between, um, you know, in the right places, or phone numbers entered with parentheses or hyphens, or any, if there are requirements, make sure you show people an example of what that is. People get very frustrated if they're trying to fill out a form and it keeps saying invalid entry, but they're not getting the right kind of feedback to know what a valid entry would be. Um, and then the last item on here is just kind of a, a, a throwaway that I thought I'd mention. I thought this was an interesting research um, done, was that if you're asking people during the account creation process where they're creating their account and you're asking them for a password, people very often get confused in that they think that maybe they're supposed to already know a password, and that the system is going to be generating a password for them and they don't know what that is, if you want people to make up their own password, make sure that you label that something like choose a password as opposed to password so that they understand that they get to enter their own. And if there are requirements such as it has to contain a number or uh, a special character, make sure that you list those as well. Um, and here again, just an example from from the site, if we're asking for birth date or gender, we actually did some usability testing on, on one uh, client site and it asked for birth date and we had one of our usability testers got a little bit offended and he said, you know, it was an older gentleman, he said, I'm not going to give them my birth date, there's no business of theirs how old I am, you know, and in this case there may be a good reason for asking for that, but if people don't know, it felt a little bit intrusive. So this is a good example of just giving a little bit more information to your, to your users. Um, number seven here, trust marks. Trust marks are things like, um, like a little security sign. If you have in data encryption, you can put a logo from whoever's doing providing that data encryption uh, security certificate on the screen. Or if you have a guarantee, like a money back guarantee, put that in as part of your checkout process. These are reassurances. The trust marks mean anything that's going to build people's trust in completing that process. And possibly the strongest uh, trust mark that you're going to have is your logo. Make sure that your logo is very visible on there to reassure people that you are a college or university um, and that, that's, that, that in and of itself, your brand carries a lot of trust. There's also the option of having a privacy notice, especially if you're asking for people's email address and things like that. This is Amazon. There's a little link in their footer one of the few links they have on the page that pops open this privacy notice. And then one more uh, example from the uh, A-B testing. The one on the left, the one on the right, the only difference is they change the word on the button, place my order versus finalize, and they've got a little, uh, a little uh, lock there. And what we found, 20% more revenue per visitor to their site from the one on the left. So those trust marks do work. And then number eight, I know we're reaching three o'clock. We started just a little bit late, so I'm going to just push through these, if that's okay with, uh, with you guys, Chuck. That's just fine. Go ahead. Good, good. Um, deep link to course pages. So I know that many, uh, many sites that we look at, there is the university sort of main site, and then at some point people click through from that main website into a registration system, whether it may be Aceware, your Aceware portal. Um, when you're doing that and you're linking from your main site to your portal, um, this sounds obvious, but I've got to tell you that we see probably half of, of the, the schools that we've worked with um, will link from their once someone finds a course on the main site, 
the link takes them to a listing or a search option on their registration system site and the people have to go through the whole process of finding that course again and boy this just kills your conversion rate so when at all possible and, and we have found ways of, of you know drilling in and on Aceware this is very very straightforward to do uh, and easy if you're an Aceware client to link directly to a course in, in their registration system we found ways of even jerry-rigging uh, other other systems and making this work so there's almost always a way to do this so the idea being again here's a little diagram of this so people find a course or a certificate on your on your university kind of based site and then they're ready to register they click the button do you take them to a listing of options in your registration system or do you take them as the arrow on the left is pointing straight to that particular certificate or course in the registration system and obviously what I'm suggesting is the, the option on the left here is much more powerful. That's the one you want to do. Um, this, is a, this is a snapshot of a, of a registration process. Actually, this is just, just the lead-in to get to the point where we're creating, where we have an account created. Um, and in this case, we were doing some, we call it kind of conversion process optimization or re-engineering uh, a little bit the, the conversion process. Um, and what we found is that we were able to bypass three of these steps um, just by re-engineering this process a little bit and cut something that had nine, that took nine clicks down to only six clicks. Uh, really simplifying that process and, and the idea being that, that every time someone has to click from one step to the next, you're going to lose a few people uh, in that process. Uh, number nine, simple and straightforward, but if people do get to a point in your checkout process and they get confused or they're trying to enter some piece of information and they just can't get it right, it's, it's saying this is not a valid entry, for whatever reason, if people get to a point and they want to just call and talk to somebody, um, if you have the staffing to support it, put a phone number on every page of your checkout process. Give people that out. Now, sites like Amazon, they don't do that because they don't want to bear the costs of having to man phones. They want people to register online. But that's a business decision that you'll have to make. You know, if, you're, if I'm selling a $3,000 certificate program, you know what? If people are having any sort of trouble, and very often it's not a problem in your registration system. It's just a problem with, with the way that they're approaching it. But if they're getting confused, good Lord, I want them to call me. Let's talk about it um, rather than going away frustrated and maybe going to a competitor program. And then the last option here um, is that we know from research, uh, and, and this is one that you really have to kind of think about and balance, and I'll talk about the pros and cons of this, but research has shown from a pure conversion perspective, allowing people to to complete a transaction online without creating an account will raise your conversion rate almost across the board uh, in almost all cases. So if people can, can register without creating an account, you will probably have a higher registration rate. Now, the pros and cons of this is we have to balance this against a couple things. One is, uh, and probably the biggest one is, if you allow people to register without creating an account, you're going to end up over time with a lot of duplicate records in your registration system. Uh, because every time someone enro enrolls, it doesn't know that they're already in the system. So the system's going to add them as a second person. And that's the primary reason why most, um, why most enrollment systems, including Aceware, don't promote that. Because you want to have that, you want that person's account to grow over time and to have a good, clean set of data of, of your people. However, there are situations, particular instances, uh, such as if you're running a conference where chances are those people coming to that conference are not going to be long-term customers and take more courses with you. Um, Aceware, for example, has, has a one-page sign-up form that you can create in the system that really simplifies this and lets people just sign up for an event um, very, very quickly. and, and, and uh, perhaps with less complication than going through the checkout process and creating an account. So if I was doing an event like that, I might consider doing a, that one page um, 
checkout process. And the other scenario where I might do that is if I'm talking about a high dollar certificate program, you know, if I've got something that's that's three thousand or five thousand or ten thousand um, dollars per enrollment, um, I will bear the burden on my staff of of deduping those records. It's much more important to me to give them a simple way to enroll. Um, than than it is having some data cleanup to do to do after the fact. So if if your goal is if it's more important to you to have the enrollments than to worry about the duplicate records, letting people bypass bypass account creation may be a good option. And if you can't do that, here's a, here's the thing. So if you're not going to um, bypass it, but you but you want people to create accounts. Tell them why it's important. Tell them what's in it for them if they go through the process of creating an account. So here's a little screenshot that says, you know, new and returning students can log in and you can do all of these things. And, and that actually would show up on that account creation page to show people why it's not just for you that they're creating this account, but it actually benefits them. Um, and then I, I do have this one little bonus that I'll that I'll throw in, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, and that is um, coupon codes. This was an interesting little bit of research that I found uh, a couple years ago. Um, in that, whenever people I call it the Dell effect, right? Because I know that Dell has coupons all over the place on the internet. So if I'm going to buy something with Dell, the first thing I'm going to do is to go and see if I can find a coupon to get ten or twenty dollars off uh, whatever that is that I'm that I'm about to buy. And people have some people, some portion of our customers have become accustomed to this. And so, when people see a coupon code on your website, they may be incentivized to stop the checkout process and go look and see if they can find an online coupon. So, what we did, what the screenshot you see here at Emory is, what we did is we disguised the coupon code as an other group ID. And then group IDs we gave out to people. It could be to an alumni uh, group, or it could be to whomever. Whomever you would normally be giving coupon codes to, you instead say, here's your group ID that will qualify you for X discount. So when people who don't have a coupon code or a group ID come to the website, they think nothing of it, and they're just going to proceed to check out normally. But those people that, that do have a special discount, they see the option for other group IDs. So, a little bonus there that that you may think about using. It's just it's kind of changing a little bit of your business processes um, and also changing that label. So, in summary, I won't read these out to you uh, for the sake of time. But that is eleven, uh, ten plus one bonus um, little best practices that you can implement. Many of without a lot of of, of intense work. Uh, again, I recommend testing most of these things. So if you're going to make big changes to your checkout process, make sure those changes are taking you in a positive direction by doing some A-B testing with Google's website optimizer or something uh, similar to that. But these are all techniques that you may be able to use to improve um, the, the checkout process. So in summary, um, you know, my, my theme of this is I was thinking about kind of how to wrap this up is that uh, I'm going to advocate to shift a portion of your time or your budget and or your budget to conversion optimization. Make sure you're not overlooking this if you're spending a lot of online marketing dollars and traditional marketing dollars to drive people to your website. Improving the checkout process, it improves the ROI of all the other marketing that you're doing because this is the end cap. This is the bottom of that marketing funnel. And if you can broaden the bottom of that funnel, it makes everything else that you're doing make a lot more financial sense. So with that, um, I will, once again, I want to thank Aceware uh, for putting this together. I think this is, to me, as you, you hopefully can tell, this is a really important topic and something that I think our, our industry is starting to recognize uh, the value of. Um, and I just, I, I just love that they approached me about doing this and that we're getting the word out and hopefully uh, improving the, the, raising the level of the overall industry. Very good. Well, John, thanks so much. Excellent, excellent set of ideas there. Lori, I'm going to let you weigh in if you've got some questions from the group that we might. John, do you have a few minutes to respond to some questions? I do. I certainly do. All right. Lori, anything on the docket there that people are asking about? Yes. When you're doing A-B testing on web pages, how long do you leave up 
each page and what kind of a time value are you using for comparison? Uh, that's a that's a, actually a great question, and we I had a conversation with one of my staffers just this week about that. the The time is typically less important than volume. For example, if your website, when we did some of this, uh, we did some A/B testing uh, at Emory University. Well, they're getting forty to fifty thousand visits a month. So in that case, we were able to do the A/B testing for a couple of weeks and get some really conclusive data because of the volume there. If your volume is much lower than that, uh, you may have to you may have to be doing the A/B testing for a little bit longer. What I like to see is you know if you're talking about like a visit to conversion uh, metric, I'd like to see uh, you know at least 500 to 1,000 on each of the test cases. And sometimes you'll do ABC testing and have three options up. So you want to leave it up so you have a good number of of, of um, a good data set to work from. If you're talking about your checkout process, I'd say you at least want to see uh, a few hundred people starting that checkout process in, in, in each of the two, the two options. Otherwise, probably your data is not going to be um, statistically significant. You're not going to have a, a large enough data sample. So, so in the in the range of a few hundred, if it's, it can be clear, like if one is 70% and the other is 30%, it's pretty conclusive. If you're talking the difference of like 65 and 70 percent, you may need to leave the test running for a little bit longer. Very good. Uh, questions, Lori? Uh, the next question is actually for you, Chuck, and that is how do we get some of the things we saw on the SMU site today? Very good. <laughs> well, good question. Uh, we're still uh, soaking in uh, John's suggestions and comments. We have the draft, which obviously SMU has implemented. We're still working on fine-tuning some of the additional enhancements and uh, hope to have that out within. Uh, it will be available for the AceWeb customers probably within a week to 10 days, and we'll shoot you a note when those are up and available for uh, updating your pages. So, Okay, next question. That's excellent. Uh, you, you touched on coupons. We have folks asking if you find that coupons really work in the continuing education non-credit environment, and are they better for first-time customers or repeat customers? <laughs> um, well, I, even in our industry, I think that's a that's a difficult question to answer globally. Um, uh, here's what I would say: I would say that in general, coupons are not are are often not compatible with College and university brands, right? We're not a we're not a uh, an e-commerce retailer. Uh, you know, you're an educational institution. So what I tend to find is that if you're going to use coupons, uh, as we did at Emory, don't call them coupons. Call them call them group discounts or come up with some other uh, very fancy sounding euphemism um, for that. In terms of of using those discounts. Um, we have tr I've tried and, and measured some tests on a few different occasions with with you know testing out some coupons. I have not found them to be all that powerful. Um, typically, you know, at, at the price point that a lot of, of our courses are at, uh, you know, hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, you can't offer a large enough discount in many cases to convince people to do it. So if you're giving ten people somebody ten dollars off of a two hundred dollar course. That and especially if here's what we really found is that if the people are paying using corporate dollars, in other words, if you're doing professional education programs, we found coupons to have almost no effect because it's not their budget; it's their company's budget, and it's already been allocated toward the education. We didn't see a big impact there. So, where I think it can be helpful is a first-time customer and encouraging them to come back and take at least a second course because what we find in our research is that the more courses people take, the more they tend to continue to take. So in other words, if I can get people to take two courses, they're more likely to come back and take a third course. So if you can give somebody an incentive to come back to that second course, especially if it's maybe a couple months after their first and they haven't registered on their own already, that may be valuable. But you just have to test it because it's so varied. Yeah, that, that's that's kind of a tough one here. Lori, how are we doing? We're running a little over, but again, John, if you're okay, we'll let you finish out the questions. We'll go for at least another five minutes or until the questions run out. Lori? Yeah, that's fine with me. 
Well, I think we have pretty much run out of questions, except the most asked question today is, are we going to post the PowerPoint and a video of the presentation? <laughs> I think, uh, John, I think that's okay with you, isn't it? I think Perfectly fine with me. Absolutely. Very good. Okay. And again, uh, that's assuming our technology works and our recording sticks. So yes, we'll have that posted on the Aceware uh, website. We'll send you, uh, everybody here, who maybe some guests who aren't familiar with our archives, the link to that uh, at the end of the session. So I would like to make one comment. You had mentioned, John, the express registration pages or the one-page checkout, kind of yeah. like now that it's March Madness, the idea of the one-and-done type people come in for the one seminar and they'll never come back. Uh, we call those in ACEWEB the express registration pages. So if you've got ACEWEB and you want to ask your technician for that, that's the express reg page. So. Very good. Lori, um, wrapping up. Any other pending questions? No pending questions. Lots of good. positive positive comments. Excellent job. Wonderful. Outstanding. Awesome. <laughs> terrific. <laughs> there you go, John. That'll, that'll carry you through the weekend. That'll carry you through oh, the weekend. Yeah. Very good. Well, again, my thanks again to John. Do note his website up there, jmhconsulting.com. Um, he's good people and, uh, again, has helped me in several cases here. and. Uh, I sure appreciate, John, all the effort you've put into this, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at a conference coming up sometime soon. Absolutely. We'll be at the, uh, the UPSEA National UPSEA, Conference. Very good. Up very good. Very good. Well, we'll definitely get a chance to visit then. So, All righty. Lori, thanks for your job in hosting this again, and um, we'll let everybody go. We'll send you the email out once the uh, webinar is posted. So have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.